Hello, Melvin. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm here. Wonderful. Tell the people, Melvin, how should they support us? If you want to support the podcast, go to your podcast player and leave us a five-star review, especially if you're listening to us on iTunes. Yeah, we're really making a push to try to get into new noteworthy or just up the charts in our category, which is education. And those ratings and written reviews really do a lot to get us there. Everyone has a dream. Mm -hmm. Additionally, if you would like to support the podcast in any other way, you can head over to lifeofxpodcast.com and click through to our support page. Perhaps most importantly, tell a friend, coerce a friend into listening to Life of X Podcast. Yes. Take their phones, download the podcast, and force them to listen. All right. Now, please enjoy the stylings of Eric Tadala and Melvin Barnes on Shanghai Shek Part 2. Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is Eric Tadala. And I'm Melvin Barnes. And that makes this The Life of X. Shang Kai Shek. Part dose. Part two. Anything new with you, Melvin? Uh, nothing new. It's been a week. We're just, you know, relaxing. Just recording hanging out. I just got back from Green Bay, Wisconsin. How was the game? It was very exciting. Of the Packers games that I've been to thus far, it was certainly the most exciting. Ended in a tie, which, you know, how many people can say they viewed a tie in the NFL? Not many, but at least one other stadium of people this season. Mm, go Browns, baby. Oh, God. They had a great game, too. Let's not talk about the Browns. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, let's get back to it. Shanghai Shek, part two. You want to give us a quick rundown of uh, where we left off? So on the last episode, we... Gosh, where, where did we leave on the last episode? We were about to embark on the Northern Expedition. Yeah. So if you remember, Chang, by this point in time, has survived the triangle of power uh, where there were three guys who were in charge of the KMT. Two of them were sort of immediately dead or gone. No longer part of the triangle. And then uh, Chang comes in and he's sharing power with Wang Jingwei. Yeah. Uh, but remember, there's the sort of political intrigue that's going on regarding the KMT and the CCP. And Chiang Kai-shek is really worried that the communists are trying to kill him, or at the very least get rid of him. And there's this tension, too, right, between the Russians and Shang. Right, because the Russians, at least, they think are directing the CCP. Right. Uh, so, you know, obviously, the CCP, in their mind, is an arm of the Soviet revolutionary, I don't know. More, more concerned with the common turn than, right. than China. So, Chang thinks everyone's trying to kill him. Because of this, Chang goes on to arrest a bunch of communists and even some Soviet Russians that were in China working. And at this point, he realizes maybe this wasn't the best idea. Kind of walks it back. Walks it back, apologizes to the Russians, and goes before the KMT's executive committee and asks, you know what, I, I did wrong, maybe you guys should reprimand me. To which they refuse, and instead promote him and make him the commander-in-chief of the National Revolutionary Army and the Northern Expedition. So now, we're going to take up the Northern Expedition. Yeah. So, Melvin, what was Shang's order of business for the Northern Expedition? What exactly was the Northern Expedition? If you remember from the previous episode, and this maybe was hard to grasp because we didn't necessarily go into a long discussion about Chinese geography. Which is super hard to grasp for someone who's not. <laughs> <laughs> when we're reading this, or like even I'm, I'm reading my own notes, I'm always on Google Maps. Where are we? Trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Right. So the KMT's power base is actually in southern China. So the Northern Expedition is essentially this movement from their power base in southern China up north, and they're going to try to consolidate power over the entire, most of the country. Because at this time, remember from the first episode that northern China, or really north of just southern China where they're at, is controlled by warlords who, are, who control their own military powers. Yeah, and sometimes it's, it's honestly helpful to think about the KMT and Zhang as... Another warlord. Right, just big warlords, you know? Yeah. Uh, they're warlords with national ambitions. So they've got to march north and basically fight off dozens of different warlord factions and unite them under the banner of the KMT. There can be 
only one. <laughs> uh, so that's what the Northern Expedition was. And the first order of business was to capture Hunan province, which is, you know, actually the home province of Mao Zedong. Well, would you look at that? Right. So Hunan was divided into over 20 warlord fiefdoms. Now, when, when Chang moved into Hunan... So wait, just to be clear, Hunan, which is one province, has 20 yeah. warlords controlling it. Right. Okay. Just wanted to make sure, <laughs> make sure we're very clear that there are a lot of warlords controlling there, a lot of land. Exactly. Warlords everywhere. All right. Most of the warlords as Chang came in either retreated or joined Chang's forces as they advanced through Hunan. So this becomes a sort of calling card of Chang's northern expedition. Yes, there was a lot of fighting, but in a lot of cases, Chang simply absorbed the warlord factions into his army. Which is an important thing for you to remember, dear listener. Yes. We're not going to tell you why this is important, but keep this in mind as we go through the, the life and successes and failures of uh, Chiang Kai-shek. So after moving through Hunan, he has to move in to capture this uh, collection of cities that they call Wuhan, uh, which I think is three cities, but don't quote me on that. But we often just refer to them as Wuhan as if they're their own city. But it's also important for him to link up with the Christian warlord Feng Yuxiang, who is based further up in uh, northern China. Now, this guy is famous for some weird stuff. Baptizing his soldiers with a water hose, which I really like to think of as like a fire hose. So I don't know, I don't know if it actually was, but I just would love to think of him as just opening up a fire hydrant and just blasting his soldiers <laughs> In the name of the Lord. All of these soldiers kind of standing at attention, and he's just standing on top of this like platform with the <laughs> fire hose just blasting them. So on July 11th, the KMT's armed forces march into Changsha, which is the capital of Hunan. And by October, Chang and the KMT were in charge of Hubei province, and they had already occupied Wuhan. In Fujian and Zhejiang, uh, the warlord armies quickly declared allegiance to Chang and the KMT. So the advance has been fairly rapid. I mean... Now, how much fighting is actually going on? Uh, there's a good bit of fighting. Okay. There's also a good bit of like, yeah, nah. we don't want to fight you. Yeah. So... Because the KMT's force was pretty large, wasn't it? Uh, In the, comparison to like a lot of these, these smaller warlord... Yeah, factions. yeah. I mean, the KMT's forces were pretty large. But the big thing is the KMT's forces were often better supplied. Okay. Because they were supplied by... The Ruskies, Uncle Joe. Exactly, a foreign power, right? So, you know, they, they don't have planes or tanks. I mean, they do have planes, but these are rickety planes sure. by comparison. And as a matter of fact, I think during part of the Northern Expedition, instead of dropping bombs, they take to dropping literally logs. <laughs> uh, I mean, it would hurt. Fleeing enemy soldiers. It would hurt if, it, if a log fell on you. Oh, yeah, it'll kill you. It'll ruin <laughs> your day. So Chang is very involved in this march north. Classic and, micromanager. Yeah. Down to the allocation of, like, bullets, things like that. This is like a calling card for him. In my reading, anyway, it seemed like at every stage of any military operation that he was in charge of, there was big-time micromanagement. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it, it comes down to a lot of the cases where it's like, I need you to do something. Oh, you weren't able to do this, or you did a poor job of it, so now I need to come in and do it. That seemed to be, like, the, the format of Chang's sort of military leadership. Sure. Uh, maybe you should have hired better generals or maybe he just didn't trust his i mean for whatever reason obviously i don't know anything about the guys who were under his command directly but right maybe it was just a case of not trusting the people that he put in power that's a good point could be and during this time love is in the air uh hmm. more love yeah more love because what we're at an ex-wife and a couple concubines at this point yeah we got ex-wife two concubines so we're going to introduce new love interest fresh love who was this love interest there Sung Mei Ling. Mm. So the Sun family, they're actually a pretty big and important family in China. And Chang had met this young lady years before at a Christmas party. Uh, and he said, hey, I'd like to marry you. Met her under the mistletoe. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I don't know who you are. <laughs> right. And her dad was like, I really, no, no, this isn't going to happen. Because, you know, the Sun family is, they're a family of Christians. And at the time, Chiang Kai-shek wasn't necessarily a widely known name. And he wasn't Christian. But at this point, they are like, oh, you're a much better suitor now. So Got some clout. Right. We'll definitely consider allowing you to marry our daughter. So at this point in time, they start exchanging letters. And this is in 1926. So they met at a dinner party. And actually, the, the really bad part about this is that Chiang's love interest, Chen Jieru, is at this dinner party. So, yeah. And then as they continue their correspondence, if I remember correctly, he just more and more is complaining 
about Chen Jieru. Exactly. Yeah. Like, they start off, he was upset because she could never visit him on the battlefield. But then after a while, he's like, you know what? I don't even like her. <laughs> She's rude. She can't clean. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, Chang's love is shifting at this point in time. Now, also, with the Northern Expedition, correct me if I'm wrong, because again, it's been a while since I read this part of the book. But the Northern Expedition was most concentrated on cities, correct? So I think the targets, a lot of the targets of the Northern Expedition, especially cities like Shanghai, uh, Nanjing, and Wuhan, are key targets for the Northern Expedition, but they are also moving through the countryside. And as they're moving through the countryside, things are changing in accordance. And what actually happens at this point in time is you have the sort of nexus. That's a graduate level term. I'm sorry. Nexus. <laughs> the, what will eventually become the Communist Party's platform. So Mao is obviously a part of this northern expedition. And as it's moving through the whoa, countryside. Whoa, whoa. Not obviously. We didn't mention that at all. Okay. Well, he's in the countryside during the northern expedition. Okay. So as the northern expedition passes through, the communists, what they would do is they would take this sort of opportunity to remold certain things in the countryside, or they were observing what was happening. So what Mao ends up observing as the Northern Expedition moves through is basically you have these farmers, farmhands, they kind of rise up and they start movements against the old landowners. Now, real quick, just to be clear, was Mao already a part of the KMT during the Northern Expedition? You know what? I'm not 100% sure, but as a member of the CCP, I would assume that he's in some way, shape, or form connected. But he was already part of the CCP during the Northern Expedition then? Yeah. Okay. I, I just want yeah, to be he's completely already a part of the that, CCP which in turn is technically part of the KMT at this point. Kind of, sort of, yeah. All right. So just wanted to be, be clear. Because when we were talking about this, I was thinking, did they just like scoop Mao from like some random farming village? <laughs> so this actually has a longer history like background that i guess we need oh, to, we're gonna do mao at some point too we are but beyond beyond looking at just mao the rural situation in china was by this point in time was not great so china had been an agricultural society and things had been quite well for a long time but you had had significant population growth and obviously not obviously but there was not necessarily the same growth in terms of land so what you ended up having by this point in time was a lot of land that was concentrated in the hands of a very small number of people. And these people oftentimes would rent the land and charge crazy rates in terms of to allow people to use the land. And then they would run off and live in the cities and, you know, live the good life. So once these people had the opportunity to address this land issue, that's what a lot of people did. And that's what Mao observed. He said, yo, like the real revolution is here in the countryside. Because Marxist teaching is that the revolution is amongst the workers in the city. Sure. But Mao's like, ah, no, 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 no. I'm seeing something down here. And he writes Rural this, Marxism. Exactly. And he writes this uh, important essay during that time. So realistically, what ends up happening is the Northern Expedition is taking place, but it's also building this new platform for the Chinese communist. So Chang is sort of unintentionally building the power base of exactly who he'll be fighting soon. Right. And the crazy thing is, is even as they're moving through, then you have to have KMT forces come back and sort of put things back how they were. They were like, sure. whoa, 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 we didn't sign up for this. Like, we, we didn't sign up for this. We need to make sure things are stable in the countryside. So you kind of have the ghost of the future challenges, I guess, being born during this time. But Chiang Kai-shek, you know, his power is, is growing because he's having great success moving these forces uh, to the north. And people within the KMT are actually beginning to become afraid that he's going to become a dictator. So in January of 1927, the members of the KMT met at Lushan, and they decided that they needed to do something about Chiang Kai-shek and his growing power. So they put forth a motion to remove Chiang Kai-shek from the Central Executive Committee, which was that highest sort of governing body in the KMT, that triangular body that we talked about in the previous episode. Um, so they would remove Chiang Kai-shek from that committee, which would leave Wang Jingwei to basically head the committee and to take over many responsibilities that Chiang had had. Now, if you remember, Chiang was already worried about the communist-Russian connection um, and them wanting to get rid of him. Now, his fears grow even more on January 11th, when at a meeting, a Soviet agent named Borodin 
made several allusions to Chang's dictatorial powers and referred to him as a power-seeking militarist. The Soviet agent then sent a telegram to Li Zongren, uh, suggesting that Li replace Chang as the commander-in-chief. Li then turned the message over to Chang, you know, as a good subordinate. And that's who Li was? He was just one of... Well, he was, he was within the party, and I guess basically when someone came in and said, like, yeah, we don't like this Chang guy, he got worried and was like, I should tell Chang about this, which naturally triggered Chang even more. So now there's this sort of decision that needs to be made with respect to the Northern Expedition. Chiang Kai-shek wants to lead the forces towards Shanghai. That's northeast, right? Or at this point, it's going to be... More northeast than right. Right when they're at. But the communist and the left wing of the KMT wants to head north to meet up with Feng Yuxiang. Now, ultimately, this is where you have a major sort of schism uh, in the party. And on March 1st, the Wuhan Central Executive Committee formally placed Chang under the authority of the new military council. The council answered to Wang Jingwei, who was absent at the time, and they issued an order for Chiang Kai-shek's arrest. It was at this point that Chang decided to purge the communist. Well, at this point, he determined that he had to purge the communists. So on um, March 24th, the KMT forces enter Shanghai. Soon after that, Wang Jingwei returns on April 6th. Now, Chang sent him a letter, and in this letter, he sort of told him that they needed to expel the CCP members from the party. Had Wang Jingwei done so, this may have checked Chang's rise, and they likely would have solidified the party under Wang Jingwei. But Wang Jingwei later on met with Chen Duxiu. Now, if we don't know who that guy is... Which we don't. He is one of the founding fathers of the Communist Party. He's basically the co-founder of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, let me just pause real quick. What you're saying is that at this point, had Wang Jingwei not acted in the way that he did, that you're about to talk about, we may not have really known about Chiang Kai-shek. Oh, we would have known about him. He likely would have... He, there's potential that he could have just served in that military capacity. Okay. And then the sort of civilian leadership of the party would have been Wang Jingwei. Okay. But Wang sort of connects with the CCP. Okay. Because uh, he's... You know, Wang, I think he's, he's a little more left-leaning, well, more so than Chiang Kai-shek. So Wang Jingwei and Chen Duxiu put out a joint statement saying that the communists possess no intention to subvert the KMT. The same day, anti-communist elements on the survey committee of the KMT decided that the communists must be expelled and that the most important objective was to make sure that they didn't ally with the Green Gang. They being the CCP? Right. Okay. So, so at this point, we have two factions within the KMT. We have the more conservative party, which is sort of the right party, and then you have the, the left which side of the, the CCP. party, which is the more CCP leaning. At this point, you could say Chang is on the right and Wang Jingwei and the CCP are on the left. So the party is sort of splitting at this point in time. And they want to make sure, basically, with what's going to go down, they need to figure out who's going to be able to rope in the Green Gang. Now, who was the Green Gang? So the Green Gang is a notorious group of gangsters, or it's like a, we often say it's a Chinese sort of secret society. Okay. And they basically had a lot of guns and thugs uh, throughout Shanghai. So if you wanted to have some people do some dirty work, the best way to do it was to hire the Green Gang and they would do some unsavory things. For money. Right. So actually what ends up happening is the more conservative element of the KMT gives the Green Gang 600,000 yuan to carry out the assigned action, which the assigned action being basically just killing and capturing communists all over uh, Shanghai and some other cities in China. So between April 6th and April 12th, police headed by Zhang Zuolin stormed into the embassy in Peking, I believe this is the Russian embassy, and arrested Russian diplomats and CCP members. The marshal ordered the strangulation of Li Dajiao and 19 other CCP members. No coming back from that. Right, strangling, which is a, a, actually traditionally a way that people were executed in China. Goodness. Yeah, like they tied to a post and they put a. Yeah, we don't need to get into the details. No, we don't. But with all of this going on, that's not to say that there wasn't sort of any political intrigue on the other side. At this same time in Russia, uh, Stalin said, "When the KMT is right and is of no more use to us, Chiang Kai-shek will be squeezed out like a lemon and flung far away." Like a lemon. So he may have been on to it. Like Chiang. No, this was. 
very likely not just on a whim. Right. And on April 12th, 1927, we have the really what is the official beginning of the Chinese Civil War, which will rage for another two decades. The that Green- is so crazy. I know. It's insane. Uh, the story gets even crazier, dear listener. Yeah, please stay with us. The Green Gang began moving through Shanghai, arresting and killing communists. Zhou Enlai is even arrested, but he's released, most likely on Chiang Kai-shek's orders because Zhou and Chiang are kind of cool. Boys. And similar purges take place in Canton, Guilin, Ningbo, and Amoy. And these are bloody purges. You know, the, the, the streets in Shanghai are running red with blood. Uh, hundreds of people are being gunned down by the Green Gang. And this kind of, this catches Stalin off guard. And Stalin eventually orders the CCP to seize land in the countryside and eliminate any unreliable generals. And Mao Zedong does just that. So you have all of these CCP members who have been taught that the revolution takes place within the cities. You know, you, you mobilize the workers. But what happens now is they're forced into the countryside, which Mao had already been saying, this is where the real revolution is going to be anyway. So now you have all of the CCP running out into the countryside and establishing these base areas away from China's urban centers. And this will become a calling card of the CCP. This is where they really find their stride, uh, is in the countryside and not necessarily the cities. So perhaps unsurprisingly, once you order the carrying out of a bloody purge, you have split the party. So now the CCP is no longer in any way associated with the KMT. Shang then, at this point, creates a rival government in Nanjing, with the other government being based in Wuhan. The government in Wuhan charges Cheng with a series of crimes, including massacre, and placed a bounty on his head. The balance of power at this point is now decided by, just say Give it, it a try. No, I'm give it gonna, a try. I'm not going to do it. Feng Yuxiang. Who was a general in the north. Water hose guy. Okay, so this yeah. is the same guy. This is water hose guy. Fantastic. <laughs> that's what we, that's what we should have called him. Cheng gains his support. After meeting with him on the 19th. But then... The curveball is thrown. The curveball. This is Chiang Kai-shek's best move. So basically when things start getting hairy, he's just like, I quit. (laughs) (laughs) So on... What was it? What's the date? What's the date? August 12th, 1927. August 12th, 1927, Chiang Kai-shek resigns from the KMT. And this is a classic Chiang move because it basically screws the party. He declares his love for Sung Mei Ling and they spend this time together. She had refused him six years earlier. You know, she's highly educated. Chiang was less educated. Uh, she was a Christian. And at the time, prior to this, Chiang wasn't a Christian. But at this time, he converts to Christianity. And he seems to have taken it pretty seriously, reading yeah. from the Bible every day. And, you know, basically, Sung Mei Ling is very different from the women that Chiang had engaged with previously. This is, I don't know if this is correct to say, but the women that he dated before were maybe pretty faces, whereas Sung Mei Ling was a very sophisticated, confident woman. Well, I remember when he was at, I think it was at the Phoenix Academy, mm-hmm. Taylor had mentioned that he became very aware of the fact that his wife at the time, Mao Fume, if yeah. I recall correctly, was, you know, uneducated or uncivilized by his own accounting. And, right. you know, here you have Sung Mei Ling, who is, by all accounts, very educated, very charming, very engaging to speak with, becomes kind of like a darling of DC later in the, later oh, yeah. in this time period and becomes like a favorite representative for Chang. And in part because she's, you know, she's Western educated. Yeah. She does a lot of things that a lot of Chinese at that time didn't do. In fact, Chang and, and Sung, they held, and Mei Ling, they held hands, which at, at the time in China, like, you didn't do that. There was no PDA uh, <laughs> in, in China. As a matter of fact, my first Chinese teacher was, you know, a relatively old guy that we refer to as Pickering Lee, because when he moved to the U.S., he was in a play and... His name was Pickering. So he took the name as his English name. He would say, you know, he taught us to say, I love you. And he said, I've never said this to him. I've said this to my wife once <laughs> in my entire life. And it made me very uncomfortable. <laughs> so, you know, these types of things, holding hands, that was so not this is a big deal. Bottom this is line. A big deal, especially for heads of state. Sure. You know, at this point, though, with, you know, him being converted to Christianity, Mary's Sumi Ling. Is he, at, at this point, still separated from the KMT, or is he back within the party? Because oh, he's, he's chilling at home now. Because I was going to say, spoiler alert, he goes back. Right. Now, it's during this time, this hiatus, 
that he identifies Japan as the greatest threat to China. Japan has significant influence over Manchuria, and he believes that Japan has designs on China south of the Great Wall. Now, for those of us who don't have a map in front of us, where is Manchuria? So... Give us the chicken example. Okay. We often describe China as looking like a chicken, and the head is, extends out over Korea and towards Japan. So Manchuria, what in China they call Dongbei, is the head and neck of the chicken. Okay. Now, imagine that that chicken is kind of wearing a necklace. A chain. And that, <laughs> a real big chain. And that chain is the Great Wall. So a lot of times we, we say that the Great Wall separates, is the, the kind of top boundary of northern China. Okay. So if you go to Beijing, the Great Wall is just north of, of Beijing. And goes east to the ocean and west. Cool. Uh, Look up a map. <laughs> so uh, the, J- the Japanese have a great deal of control over the chicken's head and neck. And they're anticipating that the Japanese also have designs for the rest of the upper body of the chicken. To snatch the chain. Yeah, yeah. You snatching chains is, is serious. He also, uh, during this time, agrees. He he's, starts talking with the Germans, correct? Right. He's not, in, he's not working, but he's working. Right. So he gets the Germans to agree to train and modernize China's army. It's a 30 year plan and it starts to really take place. Built, you know, it's going to take place when Chang returns to the party. In the meantime, in Wuhan, the KMT is basically floundering without Chang. Chang was basically able to extract money from Shanghai bankers by wielding the Green Gang. Basically, people respected or feared Chiang Kai shek. So he was able to get things done. If they needed money, he could get money. But Wang Jingwei was not quite able to do that. And this is important to note, too, for later on. But the Green Gang, they're most powerful in Shanghai, correct? Yeah. yeah. So he is, for lack of a better term, I guess, using the Green Gang to fund his endeavors by, I mean, I don't know if extortion is the right word, but the Green Gang is getting him money. And they are located in Shanghai, and that is important to remember for, for later. Right. And Shanghai at this time is the undisputed economic capital of China. So, yeah, Chang was able to extract funds from those bankers in Shanghai by hook or by crook, and Wang Jingwei was not. So basically, Wang kind of just eventually says, this isn't working. We need to get Chang back here uh, so that he can pick up where he left off. So they invite Chang back into to take over the party. And Wang Jingwei says, I'm out. Forget you guys. I'm heading back to France. I'm going to get a croissant. (laughs) Right. Those croissants (laughs) are good up there, Mike. (laughs) So Chang returns and he's like, all right, well, let's get our drive back going up north. Now, when he gets back, he's like, hey, man, what happened to all the guns and the bullets and all that stuff that I had saved up? And there's still 600,000 warlord troops north of us. Like, what were y'all doing? Um... So Chang moves north and dispatches a couple of warlords in Shandong, but then he runs into trouble in a place called uh, Jinan. And the trouble comes in the form of the Japanese. This is the first direct encounter that I think the KMT forces are going to have with the Japanese. And was this going to be, was this always going to be a violent encounter? Because it says in our outline that the Japanese asked Chiang Kai-shek to avoid the city. So like, could this have not happened? If Chiang Kai-shek had just said, okay, the Japanese want us to avoid the city, so we're going to take a wide berth and just steer clear of it at all costs. But in doing so, so the reason why Chang doesn't do this is because there were, northern, there were railroad lines to the north of the city that he needed to control in order to facilitate his drive north. And there's also the point, it's like... He doesn't like Japanese. It's, we're in China, bro. Yeah. And you're telling me what we can and can't do? So, you know, there's a lot of that going on, too. Now, the Japanese, there's 2,000 Japanese civilians in Jinan. In Japan, like Arif has already mentioned, asked Chang to avoid the city. But he needed to control the railway lines to the north. As Chang's forces approached the city, Tokyo dispatched 5,000 soldiers under General Fukuda. As Chang got even closer to the city, you know, he's nervous for good reasons. Because the Japanese are, at this time in their history, the military itself is highly belligerent. Right. Like they're, they're ready to fight. So things were calm at first, but Chinese troops, as they enter the city, allegedly begin tearing down Japanese flags, and tensions were high. 
Chang decided to take his troops out of Jinan, leaving only a few, but the Japanese arrested Nanjing's foreign affairs officer and claimed that they were being shot at by snipers from his office building. This KMT official refused to kneel to the Japanese, and as a result, they cut out his tongue, gouged out his eyes, and shot him multiple times. Jeez. Killing him, obviously. Yeah, clearly. Um, this was the first time that Chang used the term in his diary, dwarf pirates. To refer to the Japanese. Right, which is a pejorative that the Chinese have directed at the Japanese. In response, his generals pressured Chang to bring up his artillery and use his um, 100,000 men to take on the Japanese in the city, who only had about 5,000 men. But Chang knew better. Japanese were better trained, better equipped, and at this point in time, numbers hardly mattered. They would have been able to reinforce the troops that were there. Now, word gets to Japan, and they bring in an additional 16,000 troops from Korea and Manchuria. Then Chang agreed to leave the city, leaving only a small number of troops, but the Japanese demanded a full withdrawal, and they attacked the remaining troops, killing between 2,000 and 11,000, while losing, by their own numbers, only 86 men. That's crazy. Yeah, and, and if you, like, you know... That's an absolute beating. When we get into discussions of the Second World War, you'll see that these numbers happen... They're consistent. A lot. I don't want to jump ahead, but just reading Taylor's book in general, like during like the Chinese Civil War, just the absolute number of people that are casualties. Oh, these, the are the la- these are the largest conflicts, some of the largest conflicts on earth in it human is like, history. You read it and like you, you double take and then you make sure that you didn't just read a typo. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like it's mm-hmm. insane. And, you know, American forces during this time, they didn't understand why Chang was so hesitant. And a lot of times he's like, well, listen, I fought these guys five years ago. And they smoked us, you know? So there, I think there's at one point, which may or may not come up later in a later episode, Chiang Kai-shek wanted 20 to 1 odds yeah. before fighting the Japanese. And experience had kind of said, you know, at least with the, the current level of training of my troops, we need that. Yeah, because I, I don't think we can overstate how good the Japanese were. How good the Japanese were in comparison to the Chinese forces. And, I mean, just in general, really. Because, yeah. you know, we mentioned in the first episode that, you know, the Japanese had just handed Russia a loss in, well, not just by this point. Well, in but, 1905. Yeah, recently enough. These are the mm-hmm. same Japanese who had proven that they could stand up to any military Right, force. and in, in a few years, they're going to run the Americans, the British, the Australians. They're going to run all of us out of South Asia. So, they're good. Can't overstate how good they are. Right. So at this point, Chang hated the Japanese and vowed to every day write a way to kill the Japanese. (laughs) And he writes the word revenge in his diary every day to stress that he must be patient. And uh, this was a wise approach. I mean, because at that time, they just could not have confronted. Yeah. No, he wasn't going to win. The the Japanese. The crazy thing is the depths of Japan's, the military, Japanese military's treachery only gets a little deeper. After this, because there's a warlord that controls northeastern China, Dongbei, Manchuria, um, and his name was Zhang Zuolin, and he was working with Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, and he's the young marshal, correct? No, the young marshal is his son. Oh, so okay. Zhang Zuolin, and then his son is Zhang Xueliang. So he's the old marshal. Yeah, I guess you can put it that, <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> but on August 6th, the northern expedition successfully takes Peking, or okay. Beijing. So that... They were successful in retaking what many people considered to be the political capital of China. Okay. So basically, a lot of these warlords fought over that, the Peking area, the Beijing area, because internationally, a lot of people considered whoever controlled Beijing was the head of China. Okay. And going forward, are we going to refer to it as Beijing or Peking? Let's just say Beijing. We're going to go with Beijing. All right. Just want to, uh, just want to make sure we're consistent. Or if we want to be historically correct, it would be Beiping. You know when we weren't historically correct? A lot of this. So let's just a go lot Beijing. Of, especially in the Mother, <laughs> Mother Teresa episode. I don't know if you remember how bad we were with the... Uh, the names. Right. Or the places. So we're just going to Beijing. call it Beijing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the old marshal gets killed by the Japanese. All right. Basically, he's riding a train and the Japanese blow the train up as it's crossing over a bridge, killing him. Uh, so they get him out of the way. And they had, they had basically warned him that you need to align yourself with us and not with Chiang Kai-shek. So he's dead uh, because the Japanese wanted to firmly keep 
Manchuria in as a sphere of influence for Japan. Now this brings up Zhang Zuolin's son, uh, the young marshal Zhang Shuiliang, who is pretty. He's a playboy and an opium addict, uh, but he's plays an important role throughout the rest of uh, this story. When I was reading this, I imagined him as like Tony Stark before he becomes like a prisoner of war and reforms. It would just be like <laughs> if he just continued to be a very wealthy playboy and opium addict. Chinese Tony Stark. Pretty much. Okay. We'll, we'll run with There's that. There's just no redemptive arc for him. So, obviously, the young Marshall hated the Japanese because, you know, they, they blew up his father. And, you know, they were trying to control his home territory. Now, things, I guess, for Chang and the Northern Expedition were looking good because they had just captured Beijing. But not everything is rosy because Chang, on this long road, as we have mentioned, has successfully created a system of overlapping warlord allegiances. Yeah. Because... Like we mentioned, a lot of the, the Northern Expedition, they were not fighting the war, some of these warlords. They would just approach with overwhelming force, and the warlords were like, I like to keep my guys. I'm good. Because it's important to them to keep their, their soldiers, because what's a warlord without soldiers? You're just another dude. Right. And again, you know, this is me going off on a tangential of way that I like to think about this sort of thing. But for all of you Game of Thrones fans out there, it's like when the king calls his banners, mm-hmm. you know, all these families bring their armies, but their men, their foot soldiers, their knights, aren't necessarily, their Loyal allegiance isn't necessarily to the, the House king. Baratheon. That's right. They feel more of an allegiance to House Stark, for instance, and then you have the revolution. Right. So th- what happens- dragons. At this point, there, there were dragons. <laughs> but no, at this point in time, what ends up happening is a lot of those allegiances start to fray, and people start testing John. They're like, you know what? I don't know. Maybe we're not going to be best buds. So the warlords recognized power, but they weren't trying to give up all of their own power. As Chang tried to create a nation state and centralize it and say, you know, we have a central army. We don't have a bunch of warlord armies, which inevitably meant that the warlords lost power. Some of them weren't willing to accept this. Sure. So they occasionally fought on the battlefield, even with Chang. And Chang creates a bureau of investigation and statistics headed by this uh, guy named Dai Li, who is notorious. This Bureau is kind of like their sort of KGB or Gestapo. Is he like J. Edgar Hoover? Yeah, he's like the guy that's like ferreting out the people who are not truly loyal. And he'll do even very dirty things like torturing people in order to make sure that everything is good to go. Sounds like a great guy. And straight. Yeah, he does the dirty work behind the scenes. And to make matters worse, the young marshal captures the Russian consulate in Harbin and took control of the Chinese East Railway. So there's a bunch of railways that are up in Manchuria that Mm -hmm. are very important. They're economically very important. And a lot of what the Russians and the Japanese had been fighting over were the railways in this area. So that Russo-Japanese war that took place in, that was completed in 1905, 1906, the spoils of war, a lot of that was control of some of these railways. Okay. So he captures the railways and this obviously angers the Russians. And like the Japanese, the Chinese forces, these warlord forces, are not prepared to face the Russians. Uh, so the Russians invade. Um, they show up and just absolutely run the young marshal's troops ragged. And <laughs> Chang is forced to tell Zhang to retreat and to restore Russian control of the China East Railway. And Stalin, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't playing. He was mm-hmm. like, yo, y'all gonna mess with these railways, we gonna mess you up. Now, they were worried that the Japanese would intervene, but the Japanese did not jump into this fight, but they did take note of Chang's willingness to back down when faced with overwhelming force. There's so many layers. Dude, it's you know Game I mean? of Thrones. I'm telling people, like, if you, look, you don't have to read fiction. About, yeah, about <laughs> orcs and dragons. Like, literally, just pick up a Chinese history book that covers this period, and you'll just, you'll be like, oh my god. Pick up The Generalissimo yeah. by Jay Taylor. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so wild, though. Like, you know, I'm probably missing something, but at this point, you've got Chang, who is worried about the Russians, the Japanese, internal fighting from his own warlords, you know, quote unquote, his warlords, and also not to mention the CCP. What a great transition, Arif. Wow. Look at me. Uh, in 1929, there's a major worldwide recession. What do we call that recession? What, what was it? That would be the Great Depression. Yeah. And this depression put a number 
on the uh, Chinese economy initially. And that's one thing too that I personally didn't think of at all while reading this was, you know, you read all about the Great Depression when you're reading American history. That's always something you learn in the classroom or whatever. But like you never or I haven't ever ever really considered the Great Depression in global context. And, you know, it didn't happen just in the U.S. Right, and this stuff ripples around the world. One thing that's actually pretty interesting, now, if I mess this up, I'd like to say I'm sorry to my colleague Austin, who has written a great dissertation that touches on this topic. But when the Americans, when we start struggling with the Great Depression, right, we decide we need to fix our economy somehow. And one thing that they start to do is they change the United States policy towards silver. I can't remember exactly what this policy is. I believe it's the case that the U.S. starts to buy silver. So the price of silver rises. Now, as we've already mentioned, silver is the King. baseline of the Chinese economy. It's a silver standard, essentially. And what happens is that the Chinese actually initially during the Depression are perfectly fine. They're actually doing fairly well. But when the U.S. changes this policy, silver starts flying out of China. And this just reaps havoc on the Chinese economy. And basically, they go from doing all right to being in the same ship that everybody else is in, and it's sinking quick. On top of that, this depression leads to the death of tens of thousands of Chinese due to malnutrition. Tens of thousands. And this obviously pushed many people towards communism, which Chiang Kai-shek would not have been happy about. Speaking of communism, the fighting that's going on between the Russians, the Jap- you know, with the Japanese and the recession, this gives the CCP three years of breathing space to build up their forces in the countryside. And Chang, at this point in time, is not a great multitasker. Or maybe he is a great multitasker. He's just still got too many tasks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, he's dealing with so much. Speaking of dealing with so much, in June of 1930, four warlords broke with Chang and joined Wang Jingwei. And this accounted for about 600,000 men. That's a... That's... It's so hard to even wrap your mind around numbers that large. Right. That just pop up like, oh, 600,000 guys just broke away? Okay. Uh, They they were once my allies, and now I have to worry about fighting them. Right. And uh, in the middle of this conflict, you know, basically, Zhang Shui Liang would hold the balance of power. If he joins Chang, he can maybe win. Uh, But if he joins the other side, Chang is toast. And that's the young marshal. Yes. So to put down the warlord uprising, which they eventually do, the young marshal joins with Chang and they put down this, this uprising, but it cost 240,000 men their lives or they were wounded. But Chang, I guess maybe in a sign of good faith or something like that, decides not to pursue these warlords into their home provinces and pretty much left them alone. I guess he assumed uh, because they would eventually come around to the revolution or something like that. I don't know. I'm still, I'm just stuck on that 240,000 casualties. That's, I mean, that's the entire U.S. casualties during World War II. That is so insane. You know, today. In a year. Today, any time like a U.S. service person is. Killed. Killed or injured or something like that, a lot of times it's, it's like news and it's, Mm -hmm. you know, and and not to say that it's not a big deal, but like. These numbers are staggering. But like, like honestly, difficult to even try to conceptualize. Yeah. It's like if everyone you've ever met or will ever meet in your entire life. And I mean, you have to think about how impressive this is because Chiang Kai-shek did this with one artillery unit that was armed with World War I cannons, no planes, no tanks. They didn't even have maps. Like, this is ridiculous. And he often just bribed opposing warlords and used tactics, you know, that worked against the warlords, but ultimately wouldn't work when he turned to fight the uh, communist. And... Real quick, you know, you mentioned the kind of equipment or lack thereof that Chang was working with. It's important to note that, you know, we're giving you these huge numbers, but it's not like each and every one of these people had a gun or was was well armed. You know what I mean? It was mm-hmm. often the case that they were severely underarmed or fighting with non firearms. Yeah. I mean this this fighting was brutal. Yeah. It was it was real brutal. But, you know, there were some bright spots. I mean, this is entering into what we call the Nanjing Decade, which was 10 years of relative breathing space for the KMT. Obviously, they're fighting with all these internal things, and Japan is occasionally harassing them. But this is, by comparison to what happens after 1937, this is a nice... It's a breather. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, Basically, you know, the capital for the, the KMT is established in Nanjing. Where is this on the chicken? This is 
in the central part of the chicken. <laughs> the gizzard? This is towards like the, the front breast, but not as far towards the breast as the Is it south of the chain? Yeah, it's south of the chain. It's well south of the chain. So if he had perhaps two chains? If, if this was an extra hanging low chain, and four uh, bracelets? Nanjing would be hanging down by the wing, I guess. I don't know. Unrelated to the bracelets. All right, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> so during this time, you know, Sung Mei Ling, she moves to Nanjing. And actually, they try to have a child, but they lose the child. And she blames the doctors in Nanjing for the loss of this child. And it's very tough on her. She gets pretty depressed. I didn't even catch that when I was reading this. So Chang probably wasn't sterile then from no. the STDs. Okay. No. They build a giant house in Nanjing. And, uh, you know, they try to have a baby, but she has a miscarriage uh, and has severe bouts of depression. Uh, and they wrote that they could have fathered it a child, but a doctor in Nanjing uh, bungled the, the procedure, and now she could not. So after this, she can't conceive. Okay. Uh, so that's why they never have another um, child. And, you know, Chang is deepening his, his Christian faith. He took it seriously and believed that there were parallels between Confucian teaching and Christian teaching. Now, just, it just reminded me that we didn't talk about this, and I want to make sure that we mention it real quick. Speaking of Chang's like, children— He's still got his son, and this, mm. you know, back to the Great Purge, his son, Chen Kuo, and I know that's not right, but anyway, he was studying in Russia. When the Purge happened. Right, when the Purge happened, and he sends this letter to his father, which is like a, it's sort of contested, correct? Yeah, so his son is studying in Russia. And I just, I know we've already said it, but I just want to emphasize the fact that this is during the Great Purge. Right. Who, not, so not right now. The Russians are allied with the CCP. Chang, in 1927, purges the CCP. Using the Green Gang. And it just so happens that Chang's son is in Russia studying. So now the Russians are holding Chang's son. And his son sends letters to his father into China that basically say, my father is a traitor. Yeah, he like disavows. Right, he Chang. disavows his father. But... You know, these letters are likely, what, what else could he have said? Right. You know what I mean? He's, he's in Russia. He's not going to say like, hey, I completely stand by my father. Wink, wink. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I just want to make sure we touched on him. Right. So Chang can't have another kid right now. And his son, his heir, the heir to the Chang throne is living in Russia. And the Russians won't send him back. Allegedly having disavowed his, his father. His father, yes. Now, in 1930, Chang has enough space. And he's like, okay, let's turn our attention back to these communists. Because I've taken care of these warlords that were rising up. Everybody's good to go under House Baratheon, and we're rolling. <laughs> dwarf pirates are leaving me alone. Right. Dwarf pirates have left me alone relatively <laughs> recently. So let's, let's take care of these communists. So, you know, the communists, to talk about them a little bit, they are a different breed. The communists are very different from the warlords. They believe in what they're doing. You cannot buy them. You can't roll into the communist base area and say, I'm going to give you a bunch of money and you can just roll with us. That's not going to work this time. So this fight that Chang enters into with the communist is a battle to the death. Battle for the hearts and minds. Exactly. They have the first bandit suppression campaign against Mao's rebels in the uh, Jingang Mountains. Now, he sends in this guy, Zhang Huitan, to suppress the bandits. What ends up happening is he goes into the mountains with his troops, and half of them are either killed or captured by the communists. Uh, and Zhang himself was captured. Now, that's Zhang. Zhang, the leader of the army that's gone in, not Chiang Kai-shek. Zhang, Chiang. Yeah, sounds totally different. But <laughs> just keep in mind, it's not Chiang Kai-shek who gets captured. captured and beheaded. So Zhang gets captured and then is beheaded by Mao's forces. So Chiang Kai-shek is like, okay, all right. Not exactly what I wanted to I happen. want a mulligan. Let's, let's run that back. <laughs> Second bandit suppression campaign in April of 1931. Chang sends some troops that had initially been under Feng Yushang, water hose guy, into Jiangxi. But these troops are not used to the food or the climate and are easily defeated by the communists. All right. Second mulligan. Right. So, you know, fool me once. Shame on you. Fool me twice. We got to do it a third time. So this time, Chang says, I'll do it myself. The third time, he leads the campaign himself, and he marches two columns 
of men deep into the communist territory. And these guys sustain heavy losses on both sides. So the communists, they're taking losses, and Chiang Kai-shek's units are taking heavy losses. But Chiang Kai-shek is on the verge of defeating Mao's troops when the thing that always seems to happen. Something happens that gives Mao and his guys enough breathing space to not get eliminated. And that is the Manchurian Incident. And this is also called the Mukden Incident, correct? Got the Mukden Incident. Mukden. You've got the Manchurian Incident. Manchurian Candidate. (laughs) There's one more name, but I can't remember. All right. Great. And I'm going to need you to come back in and talk about this because I wrote this down in my notes, but don't remember reading about it at all. It's complicated. Well, let's get in it. Uh, So in, oh goodness, in September of 1931, what ends up happening is there's a Japanese soldier, spy, whatever you want to say, who gets caught by some Chinese soldiers. Now this Japanese soldier is in plain clothes and he tries to flee to escape the Chinese soldiers, and he is shot and killed. This absolutely infuriates the Japanese. Not only the Japanese and the military, which is stationed in northern China, Korea, also this infuriates the Japanese on the home islands. And what ends up happening is that the Japanese military, the Guangdong Army, or Kwantung Army, decides on their own account that they're going to invade Manchuria. So what they do... So this is not like from the government of Japan. This is just the the military. It's important to point out that the Japanese military at this time, as we've stressed on numerous occasions, is highly belligerent, is willing to go to war. They were not afraid of fighting. And they oftentimes forced the Japanese government's hand if, okay, so like the government was not in firm control of the military. It was kind of no, the other way around. That was the major issue with Japan, was okay. that the government was not in firm control of the military. And in fact, the military oftentimes would stage these sort of attacks. You know, they, they would assassinate members of the government. So yeah, it's insane. Now, the Japanese Kwantung Army decides that it's going to invade Manchuria, and they have no directive from the government back home. What they do is they stage an explosion at one of the railways in Manchuria and then begin assaulting the Chinese forces. And in the matter of weeks, they basically gain control of all of Manchuria or most of Manchuria. And, you know, it's hard to say what this Japanese soldier that was initially caught, what he was doing. He may have just been visiting a brothel or he may have actually been doing some sort of spy master stuff and just happened to get caught. But either way, this becomes the sort of starting point for a much broader incident and the Japanese army then rolls through Manchuria and they basically can take control of just about all of Manchuria and this is rather unfortunate for Chiang Kai-shek this creates a very tough time for him so he's being now pressured by Chinese students who often serve as the sort of conscience of China you know when things aren't right you're going to hear from Chinese students and they just basically start having these rallies and telling Chang that he needs to fight the Japanese now or he's not a patriot, things like that. And Chang is getting, he's getting furious. He's like, man, listen, if you guys are really, you really want us to fight the Japanese, why don't you sign up for the army and we can go fight the Japanese? But if you ain't going to do that, then sit down and be quiet. So he's got pressure from the students which sort of represents Chinese society. And then you've got pressure coming from Wang Jingwei, who set up another rival government. Question, real quick. Yeah. So the, do these students realize, like Chang does, the force that they're asking him to go and fight? Like, do they realize they, how good Japan is and how dominant they are? I don't think they do. Okay. They basically, it's one of those things where they're looking at it and they're it's saying- It's emotional. Yes. We need to just fight these guys. And they're, you know, they're saying like, look, Chinese people are ready to lay down their lives to fight the Japanese, but I don't think they quite understand how bad. I mean, it really, it's, it's unimaginable how bad things can get. And they're calling for him to fight. And they don't really know the military preparedness of sure. China, not, not better than, than Chiang Kai-shek does. And maybe they think that once the, you know, the fighting starts, it's going to unite China and they're going to you know, be able to use these overwhelming numbers and just defeat the Japanese. But Chiang knows that in 1931, it's just, it's not going to happen. Sure. And he's got, he, his approach is basically, you can't be too rash about these things because if you attack before China's ready to actually stand up to the Japanese, what happens is you lose 
and then you sign even more unequal treaties or you lose even more territory. So Chang pushes back against this and Wang Jingwei in the south has created an entire another rival government and then you know Chang is also dealing with the fact that his son is still in Russia and the Russians show up and they say hey we're willing to exchange your son for this Russian guy that you guys are holding. And his son is, at this point, more or less just like a bargaining chip. Yeah. And Chang turns them down, which is remarkable, because I, I know a lot of parents that would be like, oh, yeah, this sounds pretty good. Uh, so basically, Chang is faced with these very tough political decisions, military decisions, and, all of, and social decisions on, on all sides. And what does he do at this point in time, Arif? Reverts to his favorite move. Mm-hmm. He resigns. Yeah, I quit. Yeah, and then this really kind of creates a balls in your court situation. Yeah, he's for like Wang Jingwei. Students, Wang Jingwei, you guys take you know take care of it. You know, if you guys think I'm doing such a bad job, I'm gonna go hang out here with my wife, and you guys figure it out. So uh, I think that's a that's a pretty good stopping point for the day, right? Yeah, and when we come back next week, we will continue our discussion of the Nanjing Decade, and the story gets even crazier. All right, before we let you all go. Just a quick reminder one more time, please leave a five-star rating and review in whatever player you're listening to this in, especially if you're listening in iTunes. Uh, we're really making a push to try to get into new and noteworthy and start moving up the, the charts in the education category. Additionally, if you would like to support us in any other way, you can click through our support page at lifeofxpodcast.com. We're on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that. Please. Tell a friend if you like what we're doing here at Life of X. Just give us a recommendation. A lot of times people find podcasts through word of mouth. Other than that, we will catch you next week for part three of Shanghai Shack. Thanks, guys. See ya.